don't have any curing products to uh, offer. The only thing I might be improve in health a bit might be the view of the world we have because we have a major problem in science. We've got university and uh, they are not allowed to talk about certain types of electromagnetic fields because <coughs> of this is military domain. So any professor who starts talking about it is just chucked out and never make science again. And then we have a big field of private research who dare to touch these topics. But then we have a different problem because every private researcher wants to become famous and so he invents funny names for what he discovered. So we've got like 15, 20 different names for the same thing and these people can't talk to each other. Now my, my lucky position is I'm a journalist and a technology scout so I travel around and see all these uh, more or less mad scientists and I am able to kind of grab back onto the, the scientific terms that are supposed to be in position for this. And it's very easy. I can take a, a real mad person from Russia talking about something, never understands, but I just look at what he does and I can, I can tell him, why don't you use this word for it? Then everybody can understand you. What everybody is looking for, kind of a unified field theory that is already there since 1902, but nobody knows about it. But it's basically it's possible to interconnect all the topics and maybe to, to make it a real appetizer um, I'm going to start uh, um, with a, a Russian astronomer Kozirev, Nikolai Kozirev who, who had a, a really funny party go, uh, going on because he, he built a new telescope and uh, the, the optics were made out of quartz crystals that were grown somewhere in the orbit um, under zero gravity, so it was a special glass. But it wasn't even in order to, to, to be used, it was closed with a normal uh, what do you call it, cap in front to pr protect it from light. And they were celebrating mm -hmm. with lots of vodka uh, that this telescope was ready, and they kept on pressing the button, although you know it was not <coughs> pointing anywhere. And uh, the funny thing is, when he saw the pictures that they made afterwards, he realized, although there was no visible light, um, he had the picture of the Andromeda galaxy on the screen. It was closed completely, but he detected uh, the Andromeda. He knew how it looked like. And then he checked the position, and funnily, it was not the position the Andromeda uh, galaxy was at that day. It was the position where it is today, which is a slight difference. It's, it's kind of 200-something million light years away. So the light needs some time to travel. So what we see is the position of 250 light years ago, or 250 years ago. But he saw the position where it is now, 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 now. And then he, he said, OK, I might have sensed something really interesting. And he just calculated, it was his specialty to calculate where to find what at what time, where this same galaxy is going to be in 500, uh, 250 million years. And he just put the telescope, closed it, and he got the same galaxy with light coming backwards from the future, traveling to our time. And it was not really as sharp as the picture of today and as the picture of the past, but it was definitely the Andromeda galaxy. So what we have is um, a pattern of, um, let's say, three types of light. One we know, it's visible. One is just as light, but traveling backward in time. And then we have the combination of both <coughs> to form uh, the third type of field that would be called a scalar field. That is just there, everywhere. It's in the same moment, it's here and on Venus and in Andromeda galaxy, it's everywhere at the same time with the same information in it. And this is a pattern, uh, once it's understood, most of the things that are not easy to communicate because people use funny terms for it or have a very narrow view on it from their uh, profession um, become understandable and it's possible to communicate in between the disciplines. And from there on it's just like uh, burning fuel. The, the understanding that begins, uh, 
like questions like what is the reason that nature looks so fractal, you know, these beautiful uh, organic structures you find everywhere and galaxies, there are some, some uh, structures in space that look like, a, like interconnecting nerves in the human body. It's, it's uh, really beautiful structures you see in nature which you call uh, fractal. The, the basic of fractal is a, a recursive process. You have a result of a formula and you take the result, put it in the beginning again, and then the calculation runs through, you take the result, put it in the beginning. This is the mathematics be be behind um, fractal uh, structures. And once you understood this two direction of flow in time, uh, one can grab this idea of how nature creates fractal systems because you have a recursion in nature that is calculable, vis visible, that you can tap in the lab. Uh, so many, many topics that are quite mysterious in science, because you can see it is like it is, but it's not easy to understand, become very easily understandable. And this goes into topics like, uh, do we have a linear development in history, or do, do we have a circular history? When you start to understand physics, becomes completely natural that we have a circular history, that history re is repeating in cycles, because this is parts of physics. So it goes into all kind of different fields uh, where you can understand how nature works and how the universe fun functions. And it all goes back to base one basic idea that is on one hand suppressed because it's too dangerous, so it's only for military use, not to be in private hands. And on the other hand, private researchers uh, can't agree on a terminology because everybody wants to be the big one. So I'm, go I'm going to try to solve that one tomorrow a bit so that everybody can go into his direction of interest. <laughs>